the tabernacle. And you remember the story when they brought the woman caught in adultery and Jesus wrote on the ground? See, it has to do with the Feast of Tabernacles. It has to everything to do with the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Bible tells you when you start peeling that onion, exactly what he wrote on the ground. Let's go to the next screen. Let's get back to the feast day. I mean, the Passover. During the resurrection week, the Passover week, on the screen you see it says Sabbath day is Saturday. That's the weekly observance, right? Now, what you need to understand is that the feast days are called they're also a Sabbath day, but they're called high Sabbath to distinguish them from the weekly Sabbath. They're called high Sabbath. And then you have the day of preparation, which is the day before any Sabbath, weekly or festival. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? Okay. See, one of the things that's interesting is that um, that man wants to change the Sabbath day. But I don't, I don't, I don't think God ever changed the Sabbath day. He never changed the Sabbath day. It says on six days he created the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. I guess those, those six days, he was wore out. You know, he, he, he needed that day of rest, right? Right? You think so? I don't think God was tired. I don't think God was tired. That was for us. That's for us to understand. It's a day of rest. And there's, there's another teaching God has, God has, has given me. Uh, about the day of rest, about resting, coming from the book of Hebrews and what it means to rest. But see, the weekly Sabbath is Saturday. And I'm reminded of a story Jesus and his disciples were out ministering and they got hungry. It was on the Sabbath day, but they was coming through this field of corn, so they started picking the corn. You guys know the story? And the Pharisees came out and said, holy, holy, you cannot do this. This is the Sabbath day. You cannot do this type of labor, this type of work. You cannot be out here doing this. It is against the law. This is the Sabbath. Anybody know what Jesus told them? He says, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man. Understand what he said. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. See, the Sabbath was made first, <laughs> wasn't it? He created heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested. He had already established that. See, that was established before he even got started. He, the Sabbath was first. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man. And when I got, when I got the understanding of that, it just, it just does, it just done something for me. Because when you understand, when we get to this, when we get into the real meat of this, the heart of this, you're going to understand why 
Sabbath was made for man. Because Jesus, when he was saying was that, because see, he called himself what? Son of man. Right? The son of man. So what the Holy Ghost was showing me was that man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for me. That's what Jesus was telling me. I was not made to obey this Sabbath. But this Sabbath was made for me. And what does he mean by that? See, we, we celebrate, the world celebrate, I should say, Friday crucifixion and Sunday resurrection. Right? But Jesus said, they asked him, give us a sign when these things will happen. And he said, a heathen's nation seek out the sign. The only sign I will give you is the sign you already have. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, three days, three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth, three days and three nights. Okay. Friday crucified. That's why they call it what? Good Friday. And then Sunday morning, resurrection. Now, this may go against a lot of your thinking. But it's not me. This is the word. Three days and three nights. These are, you can look at it in the Bible. It's in red letters. Three days and three nights. So we have Friday. Right? Friday night. We have Saturday. Saturday night. We have Sunday morning. He rose. What happened to the third night? It was three days, but not three nights. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. So, you think Jesus was just exaggerating when he said three days and three nights? He's just exaggerating. You know, a lot of times, those Jewish people, when they talk, they fling their hands, and they, they, they talk in hyperbole, and they exaggerate things. You think that's what he was doing? No. Jesus was being specific and truthful. Three days and three nights shall the Son of Man be in the earth. Friday to Sunday is not three days and three nights. Here's the problem. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, Holy Ghost, let's see. We're going to put a comma right there. Okay, Holy Ghost. I was just instructed to, uh, to do something else. Um. I was instructed to do something else. Okay. Follow me here. Screen dark? No. Anyway, follow me here. After the plague of the firstborn son, okay? We're going to go back to Egypt. After the plague of the firstborn son, the Hebrew people slaughtered the lamb, blood on the doorpost. Girded about, shoes on their feet, eating in haste. Angel of death comes and passes over them. Right? Pharaoh, all the firstborn son in Egypt is dying of people and cattle, animals, whatever. Even Pharaoh's son dies. I'm not going to go through all the scriptures. It's there in the word. You can read it. Even Pharaoh's son dies. And Pharaoh is so broken, so distraught, he remembered what Moses said. He calls Moses and Aaron back, and he says, take your people and go and do what you have asked. What did they ask? Three-day journey. Go and do what you have asked. 
So they start to leave. And I want you to see just what when they left Egypt, it says that yeah, I'm, 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 in, I'm still I'm in verse 12. Um, you know, they, they, they spoil the Egyptians. They, they borrow all kind of things from them, jewelry, fine linen, clothes. Verse 35 said, the children of Israel, according to the word of Moses, they borrowed from the Egyptians jewel and silver and jewelry of gold, remnant, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. And here's the thing here. The children of Israel journeyed from Ram, Ramses to Shakut, about 6,000 foot, about 600,000 on foot that were men, besides the children. 600,000 men, besides the women and children, left Egypt. 600,000 men. And verse 38 says, and a mixed multitude went up also with them. Now, what does that mean? A mixed multitude. See, Egypt was a financial and business hub of the known world. People come from everywhere, Africa, Asia, Europe, to trade in Egypt. Now, if these people were there and they're there doing the plagues, all these different plagues, and all of a sudden, Pharaoh is telling these people to go, and they know it was Moses and, and his God that he served that was causing these things, and now Pharaoh is saying, go, I've had enough. Guess what? I'm going with them. <laughs> I'm not staying here with these people. I'm going. So a whole host of other people left Egypt with them. Amen? Now, when they left and they got to, and, and the Bible gives you their, their itinerary. They went from Ramses to Shakut and for a day's journey. And, and then they went um, from Shakut, chapter 13, verse 20, from Shakut to Etham. That was their second leg, their second day's journey. And then in verse 14, they turned and encamped before Piharath between Magog and the sea over against Belazon before ye shall camp by the sea. So now they're at the Red Sea. Okay? This is in the second, into the second day of their journey. Okay? And so they're there by the Red Sea. So now at this time, this is, when you read the story, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh says, these people are not going to come back. What have I done? I'm going to get him. So he gathers his chariots and horses and men together, and they go after them. They're camped by the Red Sea. So when they see the Pharaoh coming, they, everyone gets afraid. And Moses tells them to fear not. God puts up a ball of fire between them, right, to hold them off. And he tells Moses, raise your staff. And the Red Sea opens up, all right? And he tells them to go over on dry land. Now, remember, there are 600,000 men besides women and children and a whole host of others. So it's going to take them a while to get across. And God holding Pharaoh off. This is the second day, right? So they're going across. <laughs> the Bible don't tell us how long it took. 
But you know it takes, when you ascertain the information, it took them a while. Maybe a day, half a day, for everybody to get across. Once they got across on the other side, God releases the, I mean, he releases the ball of fire. Pharaoh and his army comes in after them. And the Bible says their wheels got stuck in the mud. Well, the people just crossed on dry land. But their wheels got stuck in the mud. But here's the revelation. The sea closed in on Pharaoh and killed him. The people rose on the other side. And guess what? They were free. Guess what? They were free. And the Bible doesn't tell us. I believe that when they rose on the other side, it was the third day. It was the third day. Just like God said. A three-day journey. A three-day journey. And on the third day, they were free. See, going through that Red Sea is indicative of being baptized with Christ. Going through that Red Sea is indicative of being, being buried with Christ. Because, see, all this stuff that was done before they got there represent Christ. He was the lamb. All of these things was a shadow of Christ. And so when they came up on the other side, it was the third day. And they were free. Why? But see, the law says if a man dies, everything he has goes to his son. Right? Or family. But guess what? His son died in the plague. His son died in the plague. There is no owner. There is no owner anymore. They are free. God, you know, God didn't give it, put it to them like that, just free my people. No, let them go on a three-day journey. And in that three days, they're going to be free. See, Christ said, I'm going to be in the earth three days and three nights. And when I rise, you're going to be free. <laughs> huh? See? And then, once they were free on the other side, they came up on the other side, free people, not beholden to anyone. And now they had to go, they went, they journeyed from the Red Sea back to Mount Sinai, exactly where Moses saw the burning bush. This is exactly where God began to impute the laws and the statutes and everything to them. Now, you have to understand who all is there. The children of Israel. Over 600,000 men, women, and children, a whole host of others. And then once they got there, who else showed up? Here come Jethro, which is Moses' father-in-law, which was an Ethiopian. Right? And so God started exacting his laws and statutes and precepts to them. And he's saying, will you be my people? And they're saying, yes, Lord. They, they, they heard his voice like rolling thunders. And they saw his words in flashes of lightning. That's what the word says. And so they, got, they became afraid. They couldn't take it. So Moses went up to talk with God. And they said, whatever he wants, we'll do. But see, hmm, what, from the time, but see, you remember in 19 it says they got to the mount. They got to that mountain from the time they came up 
on the red, from the other side, from the time of the unleavened bread, starting back in Egypt. See, from that time, by the time they got to the mountain, it was 50 days. It was 50 days. It was 50 days. And in, 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 in 50 days, they saw God's words in flashes of lightning. They heard his voice in rolling thunders. Okay? His spirit was being poured out on them. Well, yeah, I understand. And, but it's going to be even more clear once we see Jesus. See, we ain't even at Jesus yet. I mean, I, I keep inserting him in there. But, but we're not even there yet. Okay? So, uh, 50 days, they're there. And they see God's voice. They hear his words. And... Uh, I'm going to move along here and show you something. Let's move fast. Let's go fast forward, okay, into the New Testament. Let's go into the New Testament. Jesus, ministry. Let's go to the book of John. I just showed you some shadows, not all the shadows, but I just showed you some shadows. Let's go to the book of John. John captures it like a little different, a little better to me than the other gospels. John 14. No, let's start in John 12. John 12. Now, these things that God has told Israel to do from Egypt, he told them, to, this shall be a, a memorial unto you, a holy convocation throughout all your generation. So they've been doing these things for decades. By the time we get to John. They've been doing this thing every year. For decades. I mean, there's 400 years even between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Amen? But they've been doing these things. They've been practicing this ritual. Because, see, God told them this should be a holy convocation. What does the word convocation mean? Rehearsal. You guys ever, you ever heard of, you know, the Pentecostal or the church guy having a convocation? They're having a rehearsal. <laughs> That's all it is. It's a rehearsal. It's a coming together, enacting the things that we know. See, it's a rehearsal. And why do you rehearse? You rehearse so that when the curtain goes up, the play is on. You rehearse so that you can get things right. You can get good at it. And so they were to rehearse these things so when the Messiah came, they would recognize him. That's why. Because, see, every feast day that I've showed you, that you have on your paper. Every feast day, the center of the feast day, the core of the feast days is the coming of the Messiah or the work of the Messiah. Every one of them. The Messiah is the heart of it. Amen? The Messiah is the heart of every feast day. And so I ask people, Christ said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So how did he fulfill the law? We'll get to that later. Verse, chapter 12, verse 1. It said, Jesus, six days before Passover. Oh, we back at the Passover. Six days before Passover.
he came to Bethany where Lazarus had been dead, who he raised. And he went into Lazarus' house. There's, you know, Martha, his sister, right? Mary, his sister. And Mary, verse 3 says, Mary anointed Jesus. She sat at his feet while Martha was busy. Y'all know the story. Martha getting agitated because Mary wouldn't help her. But that's not what we want to focus on. Six days before Passover, he's, at, he's in Bethany. He's at Lazarus' house. And then verse 12 says, so he stayed all night. Because verse 12 says, on the next day, the people that would come to Jerusalem to the feast, because they had heard Jesus was there, they took branches of palm leaves and went forth to meet him. So on the next day, he went into Jerusalem. You get that? On the next day. This is five days before Passover. Now, we say he went to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Well, that's another story. <laughs> that ain't what the word says. Five days before Passover, he went into Jerusalem. And they laid down branches of palm trees, and they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, bless you who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, you see, oh, man, see, what you have to understand,